All right. We are now ready for the second half of the evening and our second speaker, Pia Andrews, who I've known for many years. Um, I first ran into Pia, as we found out, 19 years ago when she was just elected president of Linux Australia, which by itself was quite unusual because she was a sysadmin and not a kernel hacker. And she revamped the organization a fair bit, as she does a lot if she, um, when she gets the chance. So Pia um, really has all struck me for a long time as being a visionary from a fairly surprisingly young age, I must say, um, with re incredible energy and deep insights and a really strong commitment to the common good which she applies in the general field as, uh, of open source and open government. So she's, she's a real thought leader in this space and highly influential. And she's been working for a lot of places where that can possibly make a difference. Um, the Australian government, Department of Finance, the New Zealand government, the Canadian government, um, three years offline, mostly from Broome. Um, built a department of 120 people from scratch in that period. And just recently, between committing to this talk and actually showing up, uh, she left that and joined AWS. Um, overall, her, her focus is on making government better. And it seems like um, for a single person to change the way governments operate is a big ask. But if someone can do it, then it's Pia. So, um, please welcome Pia Andrews for her second keynote. Hello all, thank you so much for having me and um, it's always fun to be introduced by Gernot. I have such huge respect always for, for you and the work and, and the work of your school. Um, I want to start by acknowledging uh, the land that we stand on and the traditional custodians of the land and the continued contributions to our, our culture, to our knowledge, to our, our way of living uh, across the whole country. Um, <laughs> so it's very exciting to be here. It's quite an honor, uh, to be honest, particularly uh, given I'm uh, of sysadmin stock and not developer stock. You'll have to forgive me that. But um, what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about is how openness is quite often seen and talked about as a bit of a nice to have. It's talked about as a bit of a philanthropic thing, a bit of a, you know, feely kind of thing. In my experience, um, and I have worked uh, effectively 10 years in government, 10 years in the um, tech sector, and a few years for politics in between, but please don't hold that against me because I hate politics. Um, gets in the way of democracy. Uh, but openness is not a choice. <laughs> it's not a nice to have. It is a strategy, it's a philosophy, and it's a way of being and doing that is absolutely essential for an effective, a, a fair, an equitable, a, um, a good society. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that intersection between open source, open government, and open society. And why on earth am I talking about open government at the John Lyons uh, lecture? Well, the simple answer is because you may have heard that often um, misquoted um, uh, typo of the meek will inherit the earth. As we all know, it's really the geek will inherit the earth. Um, we are the ones forging the world at the moment. Whether we, whether we intended to or not, we're building the tools that people use, we're building the systems uh, that shape how people interact at work, at, at home, um, you know, globally. Uh, people really are shaped by the tools they use. And I remember being struck by this in my very early 20s, uh, going to a, I was very lucky to go to a United Nations conference about, um, uh, it was called the World Summit for Information Society, WESIS, um, and its sister um, summit, the WECs summit, which was the um, activist uh, version. Um, I was really struck by the fact that everyone around the world is having their whole world shaped by, um, by the tools that they use. And I had this profound sense of, as a person who's grown up with technology, who's grown up with the skills and the confidence and the inherent knowledge that uh, I am not defined by the software, but the software is defined by me. I don't need to be limited by a computer says no, because I'll just make the computer do something else. That instinct, that very important instinct that software and technology should do what we tell it to do, 
not the other way around, is something that we all have in spades. Most people aren't like that, though. Most people are shaped by the tools. So I felt this deep and profound sense of, um, I need to use my skills in whatever way I can to make sure that the systems and the technologies and the software that I'm involved in actually makes the world better, not worse. Because plenty of people will be just paid to make software and you know, going into the future, plenty of software will be automatically created. Um, we need to make sure that if we want a good society, if we want a humane environment, then we need to apply that in our disciplines, apply that in our work. Because uh, at the end of the day, for the best, uh, for any, any XKCD fans out there? Oh, you're all about to become XKCD fans. Um, XKCD is, is the best cartoon for this space. Anyway, this one is called Chain of Command. For all the best Chain of Command out there, at the end of the day, it's the person who's implementing the red button that actually defines how the red button works. It's so important that we bring our values to this space, and it's so important that we make sure that we do it in the right way, to have the right impact. So, um, so just keep that in mind as we, as we jump through this. So what's the intersection between open source and open government? I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a, a comparison. So I've been working in, in the public sector uh, for 10 years, like I said. The reason I came to work in the public sector is after working in the political sector, um, being a sysadmin, I'm a patterns person. I go looking for patterns and I go looking for config files that I can tweak to make change. And what I saw in the political system was that the public sector is, is almost like this platform that we all stand on. It sets the rules. It is the operating system of society. It sets how, you know, it sets the laws, it sets the, the environment in which we all operate. Uh, and so it needs to be stable, it needs to be trusted, it needs to be uh, fair, it needs to apply rule of law. It needs to be a platform that we can all stand on in order to thrive. And when government does operate as that platform, social, economic, you know, platform that we can stand on to thrive together, then um, society is good. When it's not, when it loses trust, when it um, loses that um, perspective, it uh, can be a very terrible thing, as we've seen around the world. So I thought I'd actually make a, a direct comparison between open source and what they call responsible government. And it, it was a surprisingly good list. So open source, you know, obviously access to the source code is one of the basic um, premises there. And the fact is that responsible government is about having access to the rules of government. You have access to the constitution, you have access to legislation, to regulation, to the, the, the fundamental um, source code, as it were, of government is actually available. Uh, the concept of right to access is uh, very much part of responsible government. Freedom of information, or over the ditch, um, um, access to information, OIA. Um, the ability to appeal, the ability, ability to review. There's a concept called administrative law, and it basically means that the way that government operates should be within its jurisdiction, within its authorities, um, able to be reviewed, able to be accountable, able to be scrutinized. The right to study. Everything that the public sector does is supposed to be able to be scrutinized by um, Senate estimates, uh, by the parliament, and of course by the people as well. Uh, the right to reuse. If you can't access government policies, if you can't access government services, there's a problem. Government is about creating equal access, equitable access to everything it does. Uh, because if government isn't the sedan of service delivery that anyone can drive, then you've got a problem. It can enable the Ferraris and the unicycles, but it has to be inclusive that anyone can use uh, the government services and access government policies. Otherwise, you end up with an issue of access to justice. The right to modify. Participatory governance, participatory government, uh, has always been a part of our system. And it's very interesting to me because I've been um, a passionate advocate for participatory government for, you know, 15 years. And, um, and it's uh, from the outside and then from the inside. And, um, and I hear people now talk about, oh, imagine if we can get citizens involved in developing policies. I'm like, yeah, we did that 10 years ago. And they did that 15 years ago and they did that 20 years ago. And there's always, it, it was normal actually to get experts and citizens involved in policy development for a long time, to more or to less degree, but it's actually gone downhill over the last 10 years. We have an opportunity for a bunch of reasons for it to come back up again, but when people see participatory governance as a new thing, that, oh, how could we possibly achieve this? It's because we've lost so much history in government and we've lost so much history of how good government and good governance actually could work. 
And, um, and I, I spoke before about the concept of government as a platform, the right to redistribute. If government made more of its systems, its rules, its data available for people to build upon, to mash up, if we actually had more mashable systems from government, then maybe we could actually have the digital equivalent, technology equivalent of public infrastructure. Where is the digital equivalent to public infrastructure? Where's our legislation as code? Where's our services registers? Where's our APIs for um, major things that we can then mash up across different jurisdictions so that we can create uh, truly citizen-centered, community-centered uh, solutions? So there's, there's, there were some interesting just correlations there that I thought were quite helpful. Um, what it really came down to uh, after a lot of contemplation is that openness is and has always been a foundation for responsible government. Not a nice to have, not a fluffy thing, not a um, ideological thing. So most of this talk I'm gonna talk about um, what can governments learn from open source? So I mean, I've been involved in open source communities. Let me see, I first installed Debian in 97 from floppy disks, it was good fun. Um, uh, I've contributed source code only to the uh, areas that I, you would expect a sysadmin to, so for th systems like NetSaint and Nagios and such. But, um, but I've, I've been involved in open source communities for a very little, you know, for that entire time. And, uh, and I think that there's so much that government can learn, not just from the procedural aspects to open source and open source code itself, but from how open source communities work when they're working at their best. Noting, of course, it's a very broad church and people sometimes can be quite dysfunctional in any community. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and then I'm gonna talk about what this means to you. We'll come to that. So first of all, things like open information. Being able to make not just the source code openly available, but docs, mailing lists, models, roadmaps, history algorithms. The fact is that if you go to any major and highly functional open source project, you can see the history of that project. You don't have to repeat mistakes over and over again because someone's lost the fact that they tried it 10 years ago. You have a um, ability to easily participate because you can see what's going on. You can see what's the roadmap. You can contribute to the roadmap. You can even contribute to shaping that, which is really important. So what open information enables is continuous forward momentum, continuous cumulative development, building on the back of what's come before. Working openly is and always has been our natural state. And people forget this. Um, they forget that cumulative learning is how, over the last 200,000 years, we have actually evolved to this point and continue to evolve. The fact that a couple of, you know, a couple of um, centuries ago, possibly a millennia, we decided to buck the system and start closing all of our systems of information. You know, it's very interesting when people get very frustrated in an uneducated um, population, but then there's no access to education because we've locked it all up. Cumulative learning relies upon openness. That's our natural state. We've always innovated, we've always shared, and we've always built on the back of what's come before. So a real question for us is why that's not our normal anymore. And I think we all kind of know some of those answers, but. Um, cumulative learning is our normal state. Working openly is our normal state. And we keep locking it up. <laughs> so um, there's opportunities, I think, to fix this. Uh, there's opportunities to recognize that um, open participation is a normal part of how we work. Most open source projects, anyone can join. Anyone can contribute. Anyone can provide input, give feedback, even provide oversight, you know, get involved in helping to shape a vision. There's always a pathway, a ladder of, of participation that, um, that you can start at the very bottom or you can you know, work your, right, your way right through. Um, and for government, of course, that's a very useful lens because um, government is dealing with a um, exponentially growing set of complexities, challenges, um, intersections globally of any changes that are made. How can you deal with exponential change unless you actually tap into and enable far more expertise and participation in the solutions to that complexity. You can't uh, respond to um, exponentialism with a linear solution. You need to have an exponential response. So tapping into and enabling and, and um, amplifying the vast experience and expertise and um, everything that people can bring across the society is an important part of it. Uh, so open participation, I think, is key. 
the understanding that we have shifted the power balance, you know, from a highly centralized power approach to distribution. Governments are starting to understand that they're not kings in the castle anymore, they really are nodes in a network. And um, when you shift that mental model, um, you start to realize that you can't just um, be a bottleneck, you actually need to contribute value. You need to provide something that helps people in order for them to want to provide something back to you. So being part of a, a, a network is, is uh, quite a different sort of way of thinking. Um, there are no futures but what we build, so unless we engage people in designing better futures, we're just going to keep iterating on the past. And if you don't have a values-based, community-led development of a better future that you're aiming to, you will inevitably just recreate the past with shiny new things. And that's the risk. So creating different futures is key, and I, I'm sure you've all heard the quote, the Alan Kay um, version of the quote, um, you know, uh, you, the best way to predict the future is to build it. Um, we are the builders of that future, so actually building better futures is very much part of our job. Um, and then participatory democracy, of course, is one of the key things that comes out of the application of that tenet to, uh, to government. How to co-design policy, how to co-design services, budgets, futures, how to actually have a shared approach to governance. One of the interesting things about the treaty in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that it, is, it is, starts with the premise of shared governance between Māori and the Crown. The concept of having a shared governance with the people, I think, is something very much to explore. Um, Australia, of course, started as a penal colony, so we still need to rectify some of the um, origin story in order to become a little bit more about government to support people to live well, rather than the government that presumes a punitive um, ex you know, experience. <laughs> but, um, but actually, again, reimagining what good government could be is about also reimagining what sort of future that we want and then building that together. And of course, that, that age-old, uh, many eyes make all bugs shallow, is a fantastic opportunity for government. If you can be more open with systems that need to be open, if you can engage people in, um, you know, um, in transparency as a strategy, uh, a lot of regulators are really struggling with, you know, how do we regulate an exponentially growing um, uh, sector, like the financial sector? Well, if you took all those self-reports that people do to show they're compliant, put them on publicly, suddenly their competitors, their customers, and frankly their own staff are going to be part of those many-eyed network. Using transparency as a strategy is one of the best ways to scale impact and to actually leverage the fact that there's always many eyes that want to take uh, participate in the process, um, but if you limit yourself to the constraints of the resources within your own little organisation, then you're never going to be able to respond to that um, to the whole. Open systems, of course, the Unix design principle, which I'll come into um, in a moment, is, is key, you know. Building extendable systems, standards-based systems, modular systems, high veracity systems. I mean, part of the value of open source has always been that you can validate and test and verify how it works, whether it's doing what it's supposed to do, if there's any back doors that shouldn't be there. Like, it's always been about getting better um, visibility and veracity um, has always been a, a major um, opportunity of it. Oops, sorry. So. And the other part of that is that that sort of architecture and those architectural principles actually creates agility. Because when you can actually roll out change very quickly because you have a system of systems rather than big monolithic systems, then that's a huge opportunity for government, which um, over the last 30 years has built a lot of fairly monolithic systems that don't have those principles. Those principles have started to become normalized in governments all around the world just over the last five or 10 years. But prior to that, huge, big systems that didn't apply that principle, which are now not adaptive to change. Of course, the whole, the, the basic um, premise of Unix was about creating programs, small programs that do something small and do it well, that interact with other systems and that are built to handle tech streams because that's a pretty good and universal uh, interface. All of that leads to reusable, interoperable, modular, and extendable architecture, which is just absolutely critical for government systems to be able to respond to change. Open systems also enable incredible things. When you open up your data, open up your schemas, open up your algorithms, um, imagine if we had more open government models so that we could test. Well, this new change in policy is coming out, the government models say that it'll achieve this outcome, I'm gonna run the model with my own data, my own community information. In fact, I'm gonna run that data through my own community's laws you know, you might be an indigenous community with a completely different set of laws, and you might want to see if it actually conflicts with the laws of your community or not. 
there's massive opportunities when you start to create a uh, open system of systems. And hacker culture, of course, critical part of who we are. Um, it's not just a culture of overcoming limitations, it's also a culture of playful exploration. Public servants at the heart of it, the vast majority, care about public good. There is a lot more in common with them than you think. They want to achieve a good outcome. They often don't have time, it's often not valued, they're often told that there's no way that they could possibly know what they're doing because they're public servants. And I can tell you I've had a lot of fun with vendors coming into government to tell me I have no idea. Uh, I, uh, I do have a bit of fun with that too much sometimes. When you enable and establish a highly capable and, as importantly, highly confident public sector that is confident to engage with complexity, confident to explore, confident to see uh, code as poetry, you know, confident to um, uh, try new things, then suddenly we all get better outcomes, better policies, better services, better everything, um, better governance. So the real lesson for the public sector from hacker culture is it's not just about your skills, it's about the culture around that. It's about how you apply your values plus your knowledge plus your actions, because you can have values and knowledge, but if you don't do anything with it, then it's not going to make any difference. So values plus knowledge plus actions actually can create magnificent things, as we've seen in the open source community. Everything we do in, in a lot of open source projects is underpinned by key values which is the heart of why it's so strong. Um, obviously, maker culture is key. You, don't just, you shouldn't just sit around. Trying new things, doing new things is, is a key part of it, and reinstituting that into government is critical. Um, but also, part of that tenet is about people wanting agency in their own lives. This is Karen Sandler. Has anyone heard of Karen? Thank you, Peter. For those who haven't, Karen, thank you. Um, Karen is actually a... Um, an amazing um, proponent in the open source community. Please Google her after this. But one of the, uh, she's made many contributions in many ways, but one of the most notable ones for this talk is um, Karen at some point needed to get a heart monitor. And she just wanted an open source heart monitor. If it's gonna be her life-saving device, she just wants to know how it works. <laughs> she wants to be able to check it. <laughs> she wants to be able to test it. She wants to verify it's not going to kill her. Um, and she couldn't get it, of course, because there are no open source um, heart makers, pacemakers. Um, she, um, and, and, it, and it really raised a bunch of things because the first version of pacemakers and insulin devices that go inside you um, were all used magnetic coupling. And then at some point, they were like, oh, this is all very expensive. Why don't we use Wi-Fi? And I remember being at a regulators conference where they said, um, oh, yeah, well, we, we approved all these devices. And our regulation was perfect. It was the implementation that was the problem. And I stood up at this conference and said, as one of your besmirched uh, geeks, uh, I'd like to suggest that if you'd had technologists in the room when you shaped this regulation, we could have told you that open Wi-Fi was a bad idea. Open Wi-Fi for a heart monitor. So, just to be super clear for those who don't quite get the implications immediately, that means you walk into a room, someone could connect to your heart monitor and shut you down. <laughs> it's so much less fun than it sounds. Um, I have an actual friend here in Sydney, I think at UNSW, maybe. Anyway, who used to walk into his office and his friends would, um, would jump his heart. It super wasn't cool. The point is, the technologies that we rely on, it, it's not just about, I want to know how the printer works anymore. When, when technology is, is life-giving, you need agency in that. You want agency in that. And the fact that we have whole generations now who only know how to use apps and how to install them and, how, and installing and using an app is considered digital literacy. God forbid it. Um, we are losing agency in those tools and in those technologies. And again, in this room, you can do something about it. In the same way, if we're to extend this to, con to government, citizens want agency in the decisions and the laws and the services that affect them every day. Again, a lot less between this open government and open source stuff than uh, you might have originally thought. Openness builds trust, another major lesson, I think, from the open source community. Uh, having transparency in how you work, absolutely critical. Um, having accountability, if, if this decision is bad, being able to push that back. Being able to fork, it has always been a superpower of open source projects because if the leadership is going in the wrong direction, or at least the wrong direction from your perspective, you can go and do something else, right? And whichever is the best will be the one that survives. And forking has been the 
um, survival mechanism, uh, for the Darwinism, <laughs> as it were, of uh, many a software project over the years. Uh, roadmaps, oversight, explainability, it gives the mechanism for auditability, the mechanism for appealability. So the, the lesson for government here is the need to know culture that infected government 20, 30 years ago is impeding trust. If government doesn't operate in a way that people consider trustworthy, then they won't trust it. And when you lose public trust in the public sector, and I'm not talking about the government of the day because no one trusts politicians, um, your side will always be off the bench at some point and people don't like that. Um, but if you can't trust the public sector, suddenly everything the public sector administers is at risk of losing trust. And by the way, that includes elections, that includes policies, that includes vaccines, right? We've seen this absolutely explode over the last few years. So it is critical at this point in time, particularly with deep fakes and misinformation just exploding, um, it's critical that public sector institutions learn how to operate in a trustworthy way. Otherwise, you know, lots and lots of things are going to go terribly more wrong because people are struggling to figure out what is true and what isn't. What's true? What's not true? What's fake? Am I being gamed? Um, the most frustrating th thing for me is the computer says no syndrome, you know. Uh, oh, I, I, I know an actual lady that applied for a liver transplant in New Zealand. And um, she went to my friend who works in government, so her small town, everyone goes to her to talk about anything to do with government. And she's like, oh, yeah, I put in the application, but I, I got knocked back. And I guess, I guess that's all right, you know. If this is God's you know, plan for me, then that's how it is. She's a very religious older lady. And my friend said, oh, uh, why did they say no? She goes, oh, I, I don't know. They, they didn't explain it. And my friend said, oh, did you appeal it? And her answer broke my heart. Oh, but government doesn't get it wrong. My, my friend who works in government was like, yeah, nah. Um, so she supported this woman to put in an appeal. I'm very pleased to say the appeal came back and the woman was granted a liver transplant and she's still alive today as a result. Um, government gets it wrong sometimes. I won't say lots and lots and lots, but it does get it wrong sometimes. And if you don't have explainability and ease of access to appeal, then really terrible things can happen. Um, so it's, it's so important that, um, that we create trustworthy institutions, institutions that um, make sure that their software and their systems are explainable, testable, accountable, reliable, you know, that the public institutions can be true and reasonably independent stewards for good, be a part of society, not separate from it, and be more participatory. And of course, one of my particular nerdisms is um, legislation and regulation as code. If anyone wants to talk more about legislation and regulation as code, come and chat to me after. But I hold that if you can make, not just make legislation and regulation available as a public API that anyone can then test against and draw from and ensure that the outcomes of any system is um, legally valid. But uh, there's been a lot of work recently in the concept of drafting, isomorphically drafting new legislation or regulation as both human and machine readable at the same time. And the funny thing is that for countries like Australia, they're just like, oh, that's impossible. But you go to any like multilingual country and they're like, oh yeah, we already draft our legislation in two languages, adding a third language wouldn't be so hard. So um, yeah, that's a problem with our um, unilingual uh, presumption of uh, official systems. But, um, but when you draft as human and machine readable in the first instance, it gives you a chance to test, get a test-driven approach to your drafting, get clarity where you need clarity, maintain judgment where you need judgment, and actually then create a reference implementation that can dramatically speed up and improve the consistency of implementation of, again, the operating system for society, legislation and regulation. Anyway, slight nerdism for you, but it's the sort of things to consider when you're thinking about open source government, right? So a couple of last points. What can you do? Um, as comp sci folk, as researchers, as um, fellow geeks in uh, inheriting the earth, seek equity. Actually make sure that all people are considered and can thrive with the systems that you build, with the systems that you influence, indeed just in your expectations, in your expectations of what government delivers, what government does do and doesn't do, actually just expect equity. Because when I just find that if you set an expectation, people tend to lift to it. If you expect the worst, it will happen. <laughs> Any motorbike riders out here? Not many, okay. One of the things about riding a motorbike is wherever you look is where you drive. So if you set your expectation low, you will drive into that low expectation. Uh, vision, create your light on the hill. 
What are your values? What does good look like for you? And then don't compromise on that. <laughs> Do what is right according to your moral character. And if you do that in what you build, in what you expect, in the research that you do, that goodness will travel through. Government is a platform, of course. Build and expect digital public infrastructure from government. Look at where the patterns are. Look at what systems should be openly available and then advocate for those and build those. Unrelentingly treat computer science as a science, and Gernot and I can debate this another time, but... I can tell you now, one of the scary things that I've noticed from within government is government decided a few decades ago that the purpose of the research sector was to create commercial outcomes, which is a real problem. Um, so particularly computer science, right? The fact is that what's happening in government now is that there's too much engaging with highly paid accounting firms on hypothesis-led research. But the best person the best person to talk to to try to get a high-integrity piece of research, a high-integrity, high-veracity answer, is a researcher. Because you don't care what the answer is. You don't care if it's yes or no. You just care that it's highly evidenced. You care that it's got integrity. That is the sort of skill set that we need in helping inform policy. So that relationship between government and research, I think we need to get back to the idea that researchers need to be part of the policy-making process. Because I can tell you the accounting firms are definitely giving a fairly skewed view. Um, we need to be able to, you need to be able to continuously seek the best human impact, to look at cross-disciplinary exploration of problems, shape the better world, and ensure that it's always evidence-based and test-driven. And resist cynicism. This is Billy Bragg, most of you won't know him. Um, but he has this fantastic, he gives lots and lots of speeches about, about how cynicism is the greatest enemy of the good. Because when you sort of give in to frustration or annoyance or it's all too big and it's all too hard, you're now part of the system. So resisting that cynicism and in every way you can trying to do your part to make it better is critical because uh, the moment that you um, buy into cynicism, buy into, you know, oh, well, it's all whatever, um, then you become part of the problem. So live your values, live them unrelentingly. So just briefly, finally, there's a huge amount of investment and, and funding that goes into digital government and transformation of government systems and services and platforms and all the rest of it. When you have digital and open, I, I like to say that open that's not digital doesn't scale and digital that's not open doesn't last. So when you're working particularly in government and in any of these digital transformation programs that are happening in government, there's a few things that we can do. We can share our work. We can value and seek input. We can create natural partnerships, not just vendor partnerships. Um, modular architecture I've spoken about. There's lots of ways of working so that you end up with open digital government, not just digitized government. And uh, there's a lot of Band-Aids. A lot of people sort of say, here's a small problem, go fix a problem. But if you just add Band-Aid on Band-Aid on Band-Aid, but don't get to the systemic challenge, if you only treat the symptoms but not the disease, the disease will continue to spread. So trying to use your power, your position, in wherever you are um, to try to address those systemic challenges is absolutely key. So I'm going to finish there and just make that last point. Openness isn't a nice to have. It has been, it always will be, a strategy for, for living better and for better living. And the real question for you to consider, please, is how you're going to do your part to contribute to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pia. Um, I was just as um, enthralled by your talk as by Willis, um, oh. <laughs> even though they are very much at the opposite end. And I'm impressed about the, the things you said at the end, how much they line up with what I actually emphasized with my students all the time. And uh, few will attest to that here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So one fundamental problem is we have a, you, you emphasize the need of the public service to be trustworthy, and yet our public service has been for years conditioned to secrecy, hiding responsibility, etc. And I mean, changing a mindset that's been sort of 
beaten into people for such a long time? How can that be achieved? Uh, there's a couple of ways that I've seen it uh, achieved and I've contributed to it. Um, the first one is uh, a lot of people don't realise that most public servants, and, and honestly it's, it is a vast majority, are driven at the heart of it by trying to contribute to public good. When you, that's a little kindle in the, in the heart. So when you can actually light that kindle, when you can, when you can fan the flame a little bit um, and give people just a little agency to do the right thing, most of them want to, but they're, they're stuck by a whole bunch of systemic barriers. So um, one of the systemic barriers is that the senior leadership of the public service has been trained for many years on, um, oh, getting feedback, Boop. on managerialism, on the concept that uh, you, you know, managing people is about telling them what to do. It's about micromanagement. It's about all kinds of silly things. I think that the, um, the huge shift towards more design-led uh, approaches to services in government, even though it's been about service transformation, not system transformation, it, it quite usefully embedded um, empathy as a strategy. <laughs> So um, actually engaging with um, people that are the end users of government services in the process of designing the services created a blueprint for now transforming the rest of public service. Because you can say, well, look at how much, how much better a service is when you engage in human-centered design, test-driven, agile approaches, uh, when you actually involve the citizen in the design of the service for them. It's a fairly easy extrapolation of that into policy, procurement, property management, into the rest of government. So government's quite ripe for this right now, which is good. Um, and the, the shift in that culture away from managerialism to servant leadership has already begun. There's a whole new generation of public servants coming up that are about trying to support the people that work for them to, to do well, uh, whereas for a long time it's been about thou shalt, and that hasn't really scaled the work particularly well. COVID um, and the response to COVID has created an unprecedented demand for change, both inside the sector and outside the sector, and so, um, so the, light, the stars are quite neatly aligned for change. But it starts with expectations. When you expect the worst from a government, it'll continue to operate the worst. Yeah. Um, so a lot of questions came in, meanwhile. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which is great. Um, so I'll pick one that's been very popular. How far should openness in government go? Is there any reason, are there any reasonable boundaries? For example, Estonia has online elections. Should this election software be open? Or, uh, closed source. Good question. So, of course, there's boundaries. <laughs> Government's gonna, not going to open up your Medicare data, ideally. Um, the fact is that government needs to be a steward of privacy as much as anything. Mm -hmm. So, the concept that it's all or nothing is actually one of the myths and one of the barriers. People sort of go, "Oh, openness! You can't be open with everything." It's like, yeah, but you shouldn't be closed with everything either. Which, which is not different in operating systems. So. anything, right? Yeah. So, um, so of course. There's boundaries. Um, my argument, and it's not one that I've completely won yet, um, but my argument is the more you need to trust the outcome of a system, the more the case for openness. So election systems, I think, are a classic case. You need to trust the outcome of an election, which means this, the source code of the election system should be publicly available so that you can validate and verify that it works the way it was expected. And we saw, I mean, we saw closed source election systems in the US and some of the absolute disasters that, um, that happened. Um, I'll post some links on Twitter later for anyone who hasn't come across those particular disasters. But um, if you need to trust the outcome, you need to be able to validate and verify. Yeah. And um, so I think that those make probably the best use cases for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, governments are using private companies which use private modeling. You're working for one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, algorithm, etc. With further privatization, are we moving further away from openness? So, a very beautiful thing has happened in the Australian federal government over the last few months. Um, there was a review done called the APS Review, which looked at the federal government and said, here's all the ways it needs to change. And one of those things was the acknowledgement that if you outsource the core competency and capabilities of the public sector, then you lose that line of accountability, of transparency, of trust, etc. So there is a movement now to reinstitute confidence, competence, um, capability into the sector, at least for the core business of what government does and delivers, which is, I think, an acknowledgement that the privatisation of um, 
core things that people should be able to trust and do with government is, um, is a problem. I have a, um, a flowchart <laughs> that I had once about what should and shouldn't be privatised, which, of course, people will dramatically disagree with me on, but I don't really mind. Um, but it basically says, anything that everyone relies on <laughs> or anything which is a dependency that everyone relies on probably shouldn't be privatised because private sector is incentivised by profit, which is totally fine and predictable. It's not evil, it just is predictable. And so if something needs to serve everyone, they will always serve who's profitable. So anything that needs to serve everyone should be a public service. It should be done in a way that can enable the unicycles and the Ferraris, like I said, but it shouldn't abscond from its responsibility to provide the sedan of service delivery or the sedan of, of um, APIs or platforms or whatever, right? So I think that there's been that acknowledgement. Um, and I think that um, with the rampant use of automated decision making and AI and such in government, again, from COVID, a little pressure, massive pressure applied to the system demonstrated massive inequities. So there is a greater demand now and expectation of, you know what, if a decision is made about me in government, and RoboDead of course contributed to this as well, then it needs to be explainable, it needs to be auditable, it needs to be appealable. These are basic expectations, they, they, they come under administrative law. And so government's having to rectify the fact that 20 years of digitization of process um, has left us with systems that are not appealable, explainable, etc. Mm. So, um, yeah, and when people say, oh, but government's no different than the private sector, um, I've just written a paper uh, that you might find interesting, which I'll, I'll post a link on Twitter, which is about the application of AI and automated decision-making systems in the unique and special context of government. And, one of, and it's very rare I get to write a paper about um, the, um, uh, monopoly of, the state monopoly of violence, but it was fun to do that. Because um, at the end of the day, giving your data to Google or Facebook or whatever, they can't come around and take your children, arrest you, throw you in jail, um, you know, all of those things. And when people are like, well, if you're happy to give your data to Google, why not give it to government? It is different. It is totally different. Um, so I guess my answer is, first of all, the special context of government needs to be taken into account. Government is having to rectify um, the digitization of systems that then lost that traceability, explainability, et cetera. And so that's now become very important, <laughs> and um, which creates an, an opportunity for greater openness in government um, because of the dramatic issues that that lack of traceability has created. Okay. Um, someone decided to put your metaphor to the test. Oh, good. <laughs> And this is about your, what I would, might call open source Darwinism, the <laughs> idea of survival of the best and you fork if it doesn't work, etc. I don't completely agree with you. <laughs> Things like Linux versus BSD come mm, to mind. Totally. Um, but the obvious question, or uh, the sort of taking it to the extreme question is, how could government fork? So my favorite example of government forking is GovZero. <laughs> Has anyone heard of GovZero Taiwan? Oh, it's my favorite open source project. Thank you, Claire. Yes, you know all the things that I know. Um, so, Taiwan, um, the open source community there decided that the, that the government wasn't serving them very well. So, so they went and created g0v.tw. So, you know, played with the gov.tw um, URL. And they said, this is what gov zero, government should look like. And they built a faux government. <laughs> they built a example of how government could look. Um, but then they ended up building real things that people needed. They, they through the COVID response, they built real things that people used. Uh, one of the um, drivers and leaders, of, you know, it's, very, um, uh, it's a very distributed power kind of community, as, as is quite common. But one of the people that really emerged from there then became the digital minister, Audrey Tang. Audrey is a legend, one of my absolute heroes. And please go look Audrey out, just an amazing person. Um, so, and what then happened was a complete shift in how government did its business. So let me just give you a quick example. When Uber came to Taiwan and did their usual backdoor, just, you know, just let us in now, um, it, they kicked off their usual process and they said, okay, first we need to ask people what they feel. So rather than starting with how you think, because when you ask someone how they think, what they think about something, you're putting them in a box. They now have to defend what they think, right? It's, it's actually an immediate tricky conversation, because what if you think different things? <gasps> um, in, in Taiwan, they recognize that, you know what, if you start with how people feel, you have a chance to shift how they think. 
So how do you feel about Uber coming to Taiwan? Oh, well, here are my hopes, here are my fears. Well, what if this, what if that? And what that drew out was the values. And then they said, okay, cool, we've done that consultation, which is all done online with, with you know, AI and all kinds of stuff. And, and then they said, okay, Uber, you can come to the table or not, we don't really mind, but people from the community are going to now participate in drafting the regulation that will now uh, enable Uber to come into Taiwan in line with the values of the people, which is live streamed. Live streamed co-design of regulation based on values. Right there is my favorite version of participatory democracy. I guess the point I'm making is um, there are exemplars all around the world um, of what good could look like. And governments are forking off each other all the time. <laughs> um, and citizens fork off government all the time. We call it civic tech. You know, we call it um, civic hacking. Uh, gov hack is arguably a small fork in a way. Um, so the, the trick is to make sure that the fork then creates enough demonstrable value that then it needs to be merged. OK. Um, here's one I really like because it's very, it has very obvious parallels with operating systems. Um, security by obscurity. Um, doesn't over go open government mean that outside bad actors kind of use it by getting all data nef for nefarious purposes or simply subverting the system? Yeah. So security through obscurity, I think, has been debunked. Like, and it's been so clearly debunked that, that I'm almost bored with this particular question because it's so frustrating. Um, when you have a closed system, um, people are still going to abuse it and find the holes and find the gaps. The difference is you're now relying on the people that you've hired <laughs> or the company that has the source code to know and figure it out. You're, you're now relying on a very small group of people against the whole world. You're always going to have a whole world of bad actors. You're always going to have, and, and the fact is that the bad actors are increasingly bots, not humans, so can move at a pace and at a scale that the uh, small group of developers you have don't have. So again, the more that you want a system to be trustworthy, the more the likelihood that people like um, Vanessa Teague and her fabulous team in, in Melbourne who basically say, oh, um, ACT has a, has a election system, let's go and test it. Oh, we found a way to man in the middle. Hey, department, you might want to know about this. Hey, department, you might want to know about this. Hey, department, you might want to know about this. OK, finally, media, all right. Um, there's always actors out there that want to test and help validate that something important is, is working as intended. So openness is a means and a mechanism to not be limited to the constraints of what you can pay for or what resources you have internally. And um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's just so obvious. It's so frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah, point taken. <laughs> uh, last one, and I'm sorry we can't go through all the questions. There are way more than we can uh, um, cover here, but I'm sure if you send them to Pia, she'll be ha happy to respond back to you. Just tweet me. Um, you can send them to me, I can forward them. Uh, last one, um, which one was it? Ah, oh, here. How, and that, again, very relates very well. much to technology. Okay is how, we, how can we avoid another robo-debt? <laughs> and we had, we talked about that before. Yeah, we did. Um, ooh, did it again. So first of all, there's a whole paper about this. So I'm just going to give you a couple. <laughs> um, first of all, um, um, maintaining the concept that the onus of proof is on the department, not on the vulnerable person. A lot of people, and we spoke about this just before, um, a lot of people got really caught up that RoboDebt was just a bad data matching example. It's like, no, it's not. Why on earth did someone consider it OK to say, hey, you, you got paid money from government 10 years ago. You need to tell us why. You need to prove to us why we paid you 10 years ago. It's like, are you kidding? Um, I was vulnerable. I was in a situation. Um, I, I don't have those pay slips anymore. Like, so many people were put under such undue stress for what should have been a basic records management, records keeping, you know, proof, uh, onus of proof on the department itself. So we need to maintain that, that understanding of the power balance, imbalance that that created and, and the culture of the onus of proof being on the department for its own actions. So there's a culture thing there. Um, I think the second thing is um, transparency of how you act and, how, and what you do. Um, 
actually working in a more operationally transparent way. And if anyone wants to read something that will just make your heart sing, go and read the Public Service Act um, that was instituted in New Zealand just a couple of years ago, the new Public Service Act. It talks about working transparently, involving people in the process, having all of your operational mechanisms you know, publicly available for scrutiny. It talks about engaging the public in the process of development. It, it, and it talks, most importantly, about purpose, that the purpose of the public sector is to be in service to the community. We don't actually have a purpose statement in the Public Service Act in Australia. In interesting. Hmm. We're going to fix that. Luckily, we can now. Um, the final thing I'll say about, about RoboDebt is I think that the, um, we, it's about getting a more existentially confident and politically independent public sector. When your public sector thinks that their customer, God, I hate the word customer when it comes to public service, but anyway, that their customer, their only customer, is the minister, you have a major problem. The public service is responsible to be a steward for long-term public good in alignment with the Constitution, in alignment with their legislative responsibilities, in alignment with being a public sector, not a political sector. So political, enough political independence, and yes, when the, when the government of the day says, here's the policy, you have to, you know, you can advise, and if they still say go, you still go. Um, but you need to do that frank and fearless advice. And you know what? If they ask you to do something illegal, you say no. Uh, so that, that fierce, frank um, independence it needs to be recaptured. And if anyone wants to say, oh, well, that's a problem with this government or that government, just to be super clear, governments on all sides have undermined the political independence of the public sector for the last 30 years. That's probably the biggest overarching thing we need to fix. Thank you. Um, we are out of time, not out of questions, <laughs> uh, but it's time to wrap up.